going on? It's John back again, and I've got Michael Davis with me. But I've also got an ex-Everton player. I want to call him a legend. Michael Ball is with us. How are you, Mikey? Ballie? Hiya, hiya guys. How are we? I'm fine. Thanks very much. Thanks. I uh, just want to say, before we start the uh, the questions, what we want to ask you, we appreciate you coming on the channel. This will do wonders for the channel. So, again, we do both of us do appreciate your time and your effort for coming on. No, no problem at all, mate. No problem at all. OK, right. So, we won't keep you too long. Um, so, Michael Ball um, was at Everton for five years. You've played with some great clubs, Michael. Um, you've been at Everton, you've been at Rangers, you've PSV, Man City, you went to Leicester, unfortunately. Um, you, you got an injury there. You've played for some of the biggest clubs in the world. Um, are you, are you like, obviously, you're proud of that, but what, what's your favourite and your best memory in football? Um... Oh, I'd, it's you know as a kid, you know, like 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 many lads in my age group, and you know, you, you, as soon as you start kicking a ball as a young kid, you just want to play football. It's your dream, and uh, you pick your team. And luckily enough for me, it was it was Everton uh, going the game with my father and my family, who were all staunch Evertonians. So I was, I was going to Goodison from four four years age onwards, and you know, you know, he's looking at the players, admiring them, and we were successful, which made it easier as an Evertonian, and. You know, he's wished that you uh, one day you'd have, you you'd be able to go on that pitch and, uh, and and do it as a job. And you know, luckily enough for me, I, I got you know I got the opportunity to do that. And and that was sort of like the, the, my biggest box ticked. You know, it's it's a dream that you've always wanted to do, and very fortunate to be able to you know, put on that blue shirt and play in Goodison. And you know, wished it lasted longer than what it did. But you know, football, you know, it's the way it works on the business side of things. You, you've got to move on at times and. You just got to make the most of your career. So, unfortunately for me, you know, as you said, I played for some like, huge clubs and, and successful clubs. So, you know, it's I look back at my career and you know, while I feel like I could have done a bit more, it's it's just nice to, to, to be able to sort of fulfil my dream. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. So you 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 made your professional you, uh, debut at Everton when you were seventeen in nineteen ninety seven. At what age did you actually join Everton? Was you there from like a schoolboy? Was you there for a few years before you broke into the first team? Uh, no, coming through, you know, I was um, like I was, I was grew, I born, born in Walton, and, but I grew up really in Formby. My dad was in the pub game, and then when he sold out, he, he moved out to Formby. To the, um, and then there was a local football team, at uh, Formby Junior Sports Club, and another one called Redgate, and, and you just join join with them and. Luckily for me, there was there was a lad. Well, my dad lied about my age for the start, so he said I was seven when I wasn't. And you know, it's sort of I just wanted to get playing, and we got found out a couple of couple of years later on. But in that team, there was a lad called like Barry McCauley, who whose father was a, a a big coach at Liverpool Academy or Liverpool Centre of Excellence back then, um, and his granddad was a big scout for for Liverpool. So they asked me to go over to to the dark side to Melwood to you know, to play. I think it was a Tuesdays and Thursdays through the week uh, to train and. Uh, that year there was a lot of you know Michael O, Stephen Gerrard, Stephen Wright. There was a lot of good players there. Um, so from probably around about seven, eight years old, I was at Liverpool uh, Centre of Excellence under Stevie Highway's guidance and Dave Shannon and uh, Hugh McCauley. You know we were excellent coaches. Um, and you know back then it was it was easier for me. You know it was always difficult going to Liverpool, but they, you could wear your own football kits back then. You didn't get all the gear that you do nowadays. And the only kits I had was an Everton kit. So. It was either the home kit or the away kit, and going there uh, through the week, they have a lot of bands and a lot of stick. But they loved it. That that my love for for Everton was never going to change. And even though they were fantastic coaches, and you know they were helping me, you know I've always was hoping for one day Everton would come calling. And uh, luckily enough, it it was Ray Hall and Howard Kendall round about just before my 14th birthday to um, to get to, to kickstart my dream come true really by signing schoolboy forms and um, with, with uh, Howard Kendall in Tree Tops Hotel with my family and you know that was when the sort of the, the serious side of football starts taking over then that it, it actually could be a possibility if my development carries on so but that's how I, how the move started uh, but I, I didn't really jump straight into Everton then because 14 um, I got picked to go to Lillishaw for, for a two year scholarship. So while I was I was signed to Everton, I wasn't really going in, you know, through the week, um, training with Everton, only probably playing with them, 
with the A team or uh, any team that probably would have me when coming back from the school holidays and Easter holidays or Christmas holidays and I'd go into Belfield and train and, and get involved in how it was to be sort of part of Everton Football Club and it was then when you finish school, your white tea, that was the, probably the, that was the first time that you go in day to day and you'd be a part of uh, the whole club and you, you're sort of not shared in dressing rooms but you're in the same building as uh, as your heroes, you know, I was watching from the side and then all of a sudden you're sort of training or being, a, you know, the canteen and you see all these first team players and you're in a, you know, who are heroes or you're in awe of and you just, it just makes you more hungry to you know, to do well in the YTS and progress and try and get into that first team, first team as soon as possible. What a manager who come and got you as well to take you to your beloved Everton, eh, Michael? Yeah, it was, you know, it was, it was a strange meal because, you know, Ray all said to me, you know, they got a suit, you know, we're going to three tops of Posh Hotel and, you know, didn't have a suit, you know, didn't have anything. I just had a football kit back in them days and I had to borrow a suit. Um, sat down for about five minutes. He said, how am I? Do you want to play for the, uh, the best team in the world? Well, of course you do. And then he set me away from the uh, the table for about two and a half, three hours. I was sitting on my own in the corner of the restaurant while my mum and dad and, and Ray really enjoyed themselves. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, so they, you know, my dad's you know, mad Evertonian. He had a... Uh, a few questions for Howard and certain signings and stuff. So they had a ball and smoke cigars and celebrate. And, and I had to sort of sit in the corner and figure out and wait a few days to find out actually what happened because they were, a, I think, a bit worse to wear. Uh, yeah, but back, you know, when Howard did, did return back when I was I got into the first team, it was nice that he pulled me to one side, taking the boots off at Belfield, did a little step outside, and he remembered that day. And you know, that meant a lot to me that, you, you know, he remembered signing me and, get, and making my dream come true. But then also... Now he's now he's my manager full time, and it was just wanted to, to do him proud every time. It was worth sitting in the corner for two or three hours, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, of course it was. Yeah. <laughs> um, one more question because uh, Michael's going to ask you a few. Uh, who's the, out of the, the the top top clubs you you, you played for? Um, who was the best player you played with? Oh, it's. It's a difficult question that you I get asked this like numerous of times, and probably my answer changes time after time because you forget about certain people, <laughs> and, and 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 sometimes it's um a based on different circumstances where you know say when we were at Everton we were struggling, who was the player there who sort of you know galvanised the team and you know didn't go hiding and you know not just on namesake, you know if you go on namesake, there's so many like the run of the ball, Frank the ball, the cloud of Kinnitches, um, there's Kinchelskis, you know. Uh, like Limp, you know, there's big, big players there. Um, you know, of, of being like world famous and world class and done things well. You know, on a world, a world stage. Uh, but I, I sort of, sort of take it as, you know, I'm in that team and who can I rely on to turn up week in and week out? So it's sort of different in every team I went across. And you know, there's there's, there's some fab, fabulous players. You, you know, even young McKell at Rangers when he come through, we had Barry Ferguson. It, it was fantastic. I made the club you know, tick, even at a young age. Barry was against with all the superstars he had around him. Um, but Barry was, you know, took the captaincy armband and he made everything tick with him. When Mikel comes, a young kid, you know, from Spain, you know, he, he took it again to another level. Um, and you could see he was going to, you know, be be a fantastic player. And, and it was great to see him obviously put the royal blue shirt on as well. What a player Mr. Kinchelskis was as well, right? I'm going to hand it over to Michael now, Bally. Thanks very yeah. much for the meeting. Yeah, no problem at all. No problem. I was going to ask you a question about Mikel because obviously he joined he joined Rangers from Spain. Did you have any conversations with him about joining Everton? No, I didn't. No, no, I was very surprised that, that you know he he came back to the Premier League because you know he 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 was a young kid at, in Scotland and I don't think you know he, he played he played well. He, you know we won I think his first year. I think he won young player of the year. I won play sorry. A young player of the month, I won player of the month, and you know he enjoyed it. He was successful. He, um, you know, he scored an important goal to win the title. Uh, but I think he, because he was young, he found it hard to settle down. You know, in Scotland, and uh, when he went back to Spain, I thought that game would suit him a lot more. Um, yeah. You know, that his style was, uh, you know, his technique was obviously we all went to see it was fabulous. His technique and pass and possession. I just thought Spain was going to suit him, and he'd go on to be a superstar in Spain. So when he when he did come back to England I was a bit surprised whether the premiership might be too much for him um, but it, 
you know, obviously when I come home and you, you get to Goodison to to watch the games, you see that his game has added. You know, his development has moved on, and he's probably toughened up a little bit in Spain. Uh, and then he realised that you know, you know, even his technical ability was good. He had to rely on, on you know, putting you know, he's, he's defensive minded. It's come on leaps and bounds when he was at Rangers. So while he was he was fantastic at Rangers, he, he got even better when he signed for Everton. Yeah, yeah, and and obviously, I mean we, I mean, I mean we're very lucky here, and obviously Everton are in a good position now. They're obviously, well, I'd, I'd say they're in a great position now. Do you, do you ever think, oh, I wish I'd play for this Everton side rather than the Everton side you played for, or? You, how do you look at this Everton side currently? What do you think? Do you think, yeah, I'd love to lace up my boots and have a go with that lot? No, I, I think that every time I, I go to Goodison, I wish I could be play, playing, you know, no matter what team that we am. You know, we in, in back in my day, I know we we struggled and was going through a difficult time for all Evertonians and a person for myself. But personally for me, it was, you know, it was my highlights because I was, I was living my dream and I'm enjoying it. And I, I know we weren't getting the results that everybody liked and weren't playing the football that we liked and, you know, it was it was down to numerous of things from players coming and going and not really getting the settled side. And uh, but while it was difficult for everyone, it was it was a highlight for me. Uh, but you know, they haven't seen going forward now. They've got everything now. You know, I think obviously the last twenty odd years or so, we have struggled with this like, well money money problems. That doesn't seem to be the problem now. It's just now about building. You know, football is about brand and is about business now. It's it's just about now the brand of the commercial, the marketing side of Everton to get bigger so we can still attract these you know, good players to, you know, to start making us challenging for trophies. That's where we want to be. We want to be... Our, our mentality needs to change. You know, it, yeah, it's OK with a couple of big games um, you know, against big teams a season. That's not good enough anymore. You know, our expectations as fans have, have got higher since Mercedes come in and now we need to start proving it. We can talk to talk. We've got to be able to start you know, pushing, pushing these big clubs and closing the gap on that top six, top four, and and start causing problems. You know, other clubs have done it in the past, and we want to be doing it for a long period of time now. Um, I hope, you know, fingers crossed, we we've got everything we need. We brought Marcel Brands in to headhunt, and you know the best young prospects around the place. So we've got to we've got to use him wisely, but also make uh, get the balance of our youth and our academy. You know, we we've we've, yeah. we've, li- we've relied on that for um, you know, numerous years, which is good, but also the quality that's coming through. You know, you want these young kids to come through to hit the first year, but also be challenging for international level. It's a part playing for the countries as well. That's what they I know every club in the land are always after these types of players, but, you know, we've got everything at Finch Farm, you know, to bring these players through. And we've got to get the balance, uh, I feel, right between the youth, the, the players that are going to come in and make an impact now and also ones that are going to make an impact within 18, uh, 12 to 18 months. So to, to keep our success uh, going forward, we don't want to be taking backward steps and making rash decisions, which I feel we have done last three or four years. Which, yeah. you know, I, I worried about it because when I was at Manchester City, I sort of seen that happen where the money come in and they didn't, you know, they just sort of bought everybody. And you know, while it still worked successfully for Manchester City with financial fair play, now we've got to be a lot cleverer. You know, we lost a lot of money last year, so we've got to be able to. You know, get the balance right between the ready-made players now and the heroes that we want now, and also for the next eighteen months for for bringing the youth or the younger prospects to get into that first team and become like the next heroes and legends of the club. Yeah, the next year, the next year. <laughs> <laughs> your fingers crossed. <laughs> Is there any positions you think you know off the top of your head you think yeah we need to strengthen there whenever the transfer window may be? Personally, there is. Uh, there's a few, but I, I think our our priority, you know, we've got to get rid of a lot of players. You know, we've yeah. we have overspent some. You know, there's, there's, there's big players there, and unfortunately, you know, they haven't hit the the levels that we all expected. Um, I feel that we, what we need, we've probably got plenty of players on the books who have got this ability. Um, you know, go, going forward and you know, attack a man of players, but there's, I don't seem to be many of them who actually have got double figures in assists or goals. You know, we've got numerous of players. You know, we've got Walcott, Awobi, uh, Sigerson. I know Sigerson scored double figures last year. Um, and we've got Bernard on the other side, but I feel like we we need. I think when Lukaku left, you know, Lukaku scored all our goals, and then when he was, wasn't playing well or he was out the team, we struggled. Uh, so now I think we need to be more of a team that everyone sort of pitches in a little bit. And I want our wingers to start getting double figures. I want our strikers to be getting double figures and the sister to be double figures. And that's what obviously that wins your games. Um, 
but it's, it is it is a bit of a team. I, I like to uh, back four to be more more settled. I know injuries. I think Lucas Dean's come in and done fantastic. I think Leighton deserves another year because you know it's, it even showed this season that you know when called the body comes in and does a, a a job just as good as Lucas Dean. So you know I think he, he needs to stay. But that competition. You see, with late, with late and pushing Lucas Dean and vice versa, we want that all over the pitch. You know, we've got the money in depth to do that now. But we, it's not just about numbers; it's about the quality of the player that we've got, who's going to be starting the eleven and who's going to come in and, and sort of make an impact or, or you know, even better uh, when given the opportunity. And I think that's what the manager would want. Uh, the players like it. You know, again, when I was at Manchester City, you, you had the chance to walk out the door and, and find an easy option and move to somewhere else, or, or stay and fight for your shirt and it gets the best out of you personally. It gets the best out of you and your teammates as well. And then when you start winning, it's easier. It's a much easier dressing room to hang around in and, and you know, the bounce is a lot easier and it makes it a happy place to go in and then it gets Goodison buzzing. And, you know, we've been always used to being the underdogs at Goodison and we turn up for the big occasions and get Goodison's bouncing, it's rocking and, we you know, we get a good, a few good results and everyone's happy. But, you know, the bigger picture is, you know, try and win as many games as possible and start getting titles and, in, um, and, and, t- and titles and, and trophies. That's what we all want, and that's been a long time coming. Yeah, and, and to be and to be fair, I, you're spot on. I think we are going in the right direction. It is this season. Whenever the next season happens, I think you're spot on. I think players, you know, the bigger players that unfortunately haven't performed, they're gonna they're gonna have to go. And obviously, there is a reliance on some of our youth players obviously there's some we've got some good young players in our in our youth team there's a, a, a midfielder that I particularly rave about obviously you you'll have heard of him Dennis Adrian because he seems to have that ability and it's something I personally feel we lack in the center of the park he's someone who can turn who can who can pick up the ball sort of 30 yards out from our goal and carry the ball 30 yards before their goal you know that that sort of person who Ross Barkley, like, Hotspur, somebody who is not scared of taking someone on in the middle of the and middle of the park and push us up the pitch, and I do feel at times that we've lacked that. So saying that, for any of the younger players looking at this or watching this video, what what sort of things would you say to? What would you say now to an eleven year old who's aspiring to be a footballer, who, who's passionate about putting that blue shirt on? What skills and determination things do you think he needs to have to do it? It, it's about belief, you know. And, and when you're a young kid, you, you don't, you, you're not scared, you're not nervous. And you know, before my debut, I thought my debut took years to happen because you're just not patient. You're not patient at all. You just, you want your debut yesterday. You know, you're yeah. waiting for it, and you're looking. You know, um, I had good breaks. You know, I had Andy Hinchcliffe and Terry Fear who were fantastic with me coming through, but they were playing for their national teams, England and Ireland, and I had to try and push in. And I was looking at them and seeing what they were good at and trying to emulate that and do it better. But then also trying to add my own game, my own stamp. So the manager has a bit of a problem of, well, I can rely on him, but Michael might give me something different that no one's seen before. And and each player, you know, as a young kid, you look at yourself first and then think, what can you improve on? You look at other players around your teams you played against or you've struggled against or... Um, you know, teams are doing really well, and, and look at what what's that player doing in that position. What he's what what is he doing differently than you? Can you do that? Can you make it better and make it in your own? And but when you get to the club, you know the the club are advising and they do you know, they're the best coaches of how they find the pathway into the first team. And it's nothing better than learning off um, first team pros. You know, I, I, again, it's probably slightly different now um, than it was back in my day. But the, the reserve team is only. There's seven or eight players, and then it got filled up by the first team players who weren't playing in 90 minutes on the weekend and yeah. full of like the whites yesterday, like myself. So, you know, I was surrounded by, like, say, like Anders Limpar, Vinnie Samways, Joe Parkinson, um, uh, uh, Tony Grant, and then there was you know, the, the rest of the whites yes and, and, and the reserve team. So, I was learning off them, thinking, well, I need to, you know, the level they're at, they can't even get in the first team. So I need to be better than them, and it's so it's, it's up to your own mentality. But it's it's looking at yourself in a minute, but taking responsibility. If you have a poor game and think, right, okay, that, that's over. There's no point moaning about it because you can't do nothing about it. You can't change the result, but can you learn from it? And it's just trying to soak in all that information of when you're in in and around an environment to soak in all that information. You're getting told it's difficult, but soak as much as you can because it's only going to make you a, a better player and develop much faster. What was it? What was it like when you? Because um, obviously, I, I 
I remember you making your debut for England as well in 2001. Um, yeah. What was it like getting that call? The the England call up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. It was again. It was it was similar to me me debut. Um, I, I think Alan Myers. I was I, I was feeding the ducks with me young and, and Alan Myers phoned me to tell me. I think I put the phone down because we, we we used to put the having a bit of a, a prank calls between each other. So I didn't believe him really, and the signal was a bit crap. So it was only when I got back and you seen it on telly sex that he was actually telling the truth. Um, <laughs> so you, you know, you know the press officer trying to alert me in case obviously press phoned me to tell me or or whatever. So you know I didn't really believe it, but it was I was in the England squad a few times before then under. Uh, Kevin Keegan the first time that Peter Taylor took over Harold Wilkinson, uh, so I, I never, I just always seem to be nearly there, and I'm thinking, yeah. oh, am I going to get it? And then the manager gets changed, and you think you've got to prove yourself at your club again to get back into the England fold. And you know, luckily enough, Sven's, Sven's first uh, uh, squad announcement, so I wasn't really expecting it uh, because I don't think he knew too much about me. But it must have been on the the way I was playing for the club that he, he thought I deserved a chance and. You know, we again. I was on the sub bench, and I was thinking, "Am I going to come on?" You know, I've been on the bench a few times, and nearly got on um, once, and <laughs> it wasn't for me. It was for somebody else. And um, I thought, "Is this ever going to happen?" Uh, but that's just me being impatient. I wanted just to get out there and, and you know, sort of live your dream of playing for your country as well. Um, and then half time, Sven made the call that you know I was going to go on. Uh, it was nil nil against Spain, and we ended up winning three one. So it was, you know, again. Just another big tick off your off your bucket list, really. Of just like I've done it and I've got the taste of it. And I wanted to do more. Unfortunately, I couldn't get more than the one. Mm. I, I I feel I feel partly, and and I, I'm completely cutting in on John's questions now. So I'm sorry. I just I need to say this. So in 2001 or 2000, whenever it was, and you left Everton. Can I just say? That little eight-year-old me was absolutely gutted because you were my favourite player. <laughs> I was gutted too. <laughs> I was gutted. Yeah, it was horrible. It was um, it was something that you never even thought about. Um, there was loads of stuff in the press at the time, but there yeah. was nothing. I know the club never spoke about me moving. There was nothing. You know, everything. I was away on holiday with my family, and you know, I came home just you know, to sign a new contract. And unfortunately, the club changed their mind and. Um, I didn't really get told why. So the board had changed their mind, not going to offer you the contract. And Walter Smith didn't want me there. Um, it was either, you know, I wanted to stay. You know, under under sort of Walter, we, we, my sort of relationship with him started really rosy, and it started to, you know, all all go backwards. But in that final year, I thought I proved the point to him. You know, I, I just about got my number three shirt back because you know, I went. I mean, first number was twenty five, then I was three, and then Walter gave me number twelve. And I thought, well, I'm going to prove, you know, stay here and fight and wait for my opportunity. And, you know, it, luckily I got my opportunity again and I, I started playing well. I got play of the year and I thought, right, this is it now. My career is going to, st- you know, start a kickstart again. Uh, got my number three shirt and I was, I was ready for the new season uh, going away. And then, unfortunately, Walter uh, said I won't be playing. I'll, I'll be in the reserves, rotting in the reserves. And I had a massive choice to to me, um, Howard Wilkinson spoke to me about the England situation, the World Cup was coming up, um, and he goes, Michael, your development stop starting, you need to keep playing football, and you know, if Everton aren't going to give you game time, you have to look elsewhere, and you know, Everton accepted bids from, from three teams, and um, Trevor Stephen was my agent uh, at the time, and he just basically called and said, look, um, they just want to speak to you, um, you know, come up and just, just see what they got to say out of respect, and um, you know, stay stay up for you know for a couple of nights and, and see how you think. And then as soon as I went up there and seen the chairman and uh, and the club and what they wanted to do and how they how they wanted to push him for the Champions League and uh, there was talk of even joining the Premier League um, back then as well. So it, it, everything I just felt wanted again uh, and I hadn't felt that a while at the club. I, I loved the way I wanted love. I wasn't getting it. Um, okay. You know, and that was it was it was disappointing going back into Belfield and picking up your stuff. Um, and saying to that to everyone was, you know, it gives me chills even talking about it now. It was horrible. Um, yeah. The press, press phone, you going, what's going on? And you know, it probably it, the Rangers thing never really, ne- never nearly happened because of my injury that I had while I was still at Everton, and yeah. you know, that was a two week medical and nearly come back. But um, you know, it was just one of them things taken out of my hands, which is something that, you know, again, as a kid, you just don't even think about leaving. Um, you just think you're going to be there forever, and. 
you know, the contract talks before all this was about me captain in the club, in the club. So, you know, it was all about the long term longevity and, and staying at the club. And what, to be fair to Walter, at that time, he was pulling me in, wanting me to take more responsibility and uh, not just be, I'm not a young player anymore. So he was building me up to try and become the captain. But then through money, I don't know. As to this day, I don't know. I never spoke to Bill Kenwright or whoever made the decision of, you know, why I had to leave. You know, but it was it was something obviously I had to do for my development in my, in my career. Yeah, it was good. Well, it was gut into me, mate. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were both in tears. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, I, well, just we won't keep you too much longer, Bally. Um, when you left Everton, when you joined Rangers, it was for a club record, Rangers club record for uh, six and a half million quid. Did when you went there? Did you? Uh, and no, no disrespect, it's six six and a half million pound in football these days is nothing. It really, do you know what I mean? For some of the fees the players go with. Or now, but did did you feel any pressure going to a big club like Rangers, being the the, the transfer record fielder? Well, it, yeah, I, I was I wasn't. Uh, Tory Andre Flo had the record. Uh, ah. I was I was I think the the highest defender ever bought uh, ah. up in Scotland and Rangers at the time. Um, and yet there was pressure. There's pre- obviously when you. When you're a big sign and you don't have an Everton fan, if you see a big sign in the opposition, you you sing you what a waste of money, don't you? Have to try and you know put them off. And but going up there, you know, I, w- I was still still young, still developing, and you know, uh, the manager at the time was a, like a bit of a general. He was he done everything. The, the training was like a, another level I've never seen before. Um, you know, it was it was top notch, and the players around you, you know, they were they were fantastic. I learned so much just in training with them. We know the the Scottish League is, is not nowhere near like the Premier League, but between Celtic and Rangers, you know, the pressure just for playing for them clubs are huge anyway. Because um, in one draw, you've lost the league and that's the amount of pressure and it's the style of football you'd have to play up there. You couldn't just kick the ball 20, 30 yards. The, the crowd, are, you know, they wouldn't they wouldn't be cheering if you'd done a 20, 30 yard uh, pump. So you have to use your teammates. You have to sort of trust everybody. Um, by giving them the ball under pressure and play football in the in the right way. We had a Dutch manager wanted to play a Dutch style of football, and that was all about passing the ball and, and passing it through the lines that you see um, with many Dutch teams and Dutch coaches. And you know, so I was learning that side in the game while while I was at Everton. I was I was more defensive minded and just trying to do my job. It was more a sort of adding to my own game of getting forward a bit more, um, but more with quality. Um, you know, running the ball, thank the ball, Terry Andrew Flo and Shelsky, so, you know, he ends up leaving when I was there. But there was new Barry Fergus, there was numerous of players there were, you know, have been, as I said before, world icons and you know, won everything in the game. And so you're training with them each and every day, you're picking up all the good things, you know what I mean? You're picking up all their all their good habits trying to add to your game. Uh, for myself personally, yeah, that's as soon as you have a bad result, that's it, you you you're a waste of money. Um so I that that makes you hungry though as a player. You know it's not your fault. That's that's how much the you know the cl- the club paid for you. But you just got to go out there and prove. Well, uh, you know I deserve to wear this shirt, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best for you. And you know I got injured very early on in my Rangers career, which was frustrating for obviously the club and the fans, but obviously to myself as well personally because it was a, a long time out. Two more from me, and then we'll let you go, Michael. Um, your favourite goal you ever scored for Everton? Um. Probably against Liverpool in the warm up. No, um, let me think. <laughs> uh, it's probably it has to be my first goal. I think uh, it's my first goal. It's um, I still sort of remember the pattern how it all, how it all worked, and you know it was it was a strange game. Um, I was playing centre half the first half against Arsenal, um, and I thought I'd done pretty well. You know, marking you know marking Bear Camp or whoever, and you know, I thought I held my own and doing well. But we went in at half time two 0 down. I was thinking, how's this happened? And I got moved then to, to left wing back, which is not my me, me favourite position, but I felt like, oh, I feel like it was my fault that it was because I was a centre half with 2 0 down. And um, so left wing left wing back, and you know, how the ball got forward. And Graham Stewart still reminds me to this day that he set it up for me. Um, I scored with me header um, against David Seaman behind Tony Adams. And I sort of ran off like I've, I've scored the win in the FA Cup final. I sort of, you know, I'm normally quite calm and relaxed lad. and you know, you look back at the pictures, I'm like, I'm going off my head like I've won the World Cup final and um, did not realise and we're still getting beat. 
you know, so sort of that sort of the adrenaline sort of took over me. And you know, Danny Adam actually got the goal, and that's like a, a weird record, I think, that still stands. Two 17 year olds in the same team scored in the Premier League. So we got we got a good result that we beat Chelsea after that. So I, I feel it's it's had to be my first goal because it's something that you've again like like making me debut and putting the shirt on first. It's, it's something that you've always wanted to do. Um, last one from me. Um, whether you can say Everton or any of the clubs you, you played at, um, probably being asked this many times. Any funny stories that you can share with us? I mean, I love listening to Gaz's stories. I mean, he's just <laughs> he's a fruit loop in. But um, have you got any any players that you can tell us who were, who were hilarious? Any pranks, jokes you've seen happen? Uh... <sighs> There's so there's sort of so many that they all blend into one. You know, coming through as a youngster at Everton, you know, obviously, you know, your, your big hero's always going to be Big Nev. You know, you see Big Nev in the changing room, and you know, he was just a character as well as you know, I know he was a legend he is. But you know, whatever Nev said, you know, that stuck. You know, and um, every time you walk in in the morning, never be giving everyone all kinds of stick. Maybe Andy Inchcliffe call him. Big E is big nose, every name under the sun, they call him Parky, Baldy, anything, and they'll be giving it back to Nev. So I just sort of sat there like I was in the audience, sort of listening to all the all the bits, and Nev clocked me and he called me Bugsy after David Burrows. I was devastated. Then he called <laughs> me the then he called me the German, and then that sort that sort that stuck to this day. Uh, Donaldson still calls me the German. So like, well, you're sort of happy that like no, Nev likes you. He give you the nickname, but it wasn't one I really liked. <laughs> but you just have to take it because it was big Nev and uh, as you said Paul Gascoigne Simon Walter we were away in Italy and um, you know a lot of the lads used to go in, in each rooms and just play a game of cards or whatever but I remember one of the, all the lads was sort of missing and then you, you hear a lot of new, uh, noise in one of the rooms you'd open up and it's Gazza everyone's sitting down like school kids on a carpet listening to Gazza just tell stories after stories about his career in Italy and um it's a, every story you could probably think of, Gaza was telling everyone, and everyone's just sitting there in awe, just listening to everything coming out of his mouth. And that that was just Gaza, you know. Every time he spoke, it was there was something, you know. He was doing pranks in the car park. He was doing pranks on Jimmy Firebellies, and telling stories when he, when he was in Italy, and they give everyone an English dictionary to, to learn English. And it does, you know. And, and every club had their own. Yeah, you know, every club I went to, there was always like pranksters. So it's sort of. It's an ongoing thing in football. It sort of keeps the morale up, especially when you're not doing too well. It's good to get the, the dressing room buzzing because then you, you're in there together as a team. You just want to fight each other to, you know, to make sure you get the result at the weekend. Right, it's been an absolute pleasure, Paulie. Michael, have you got anything else to say? Are we going to let the, the main man go? I just, I just want to say, uh, honest to God, this is this is genuinely fantastic for me personally. You were so I, I played football. I played football. Well, I still play, obviously, but I I, I was playing in the Birmingham Youth Academy for uh, a long, long time. And I had two players that sort of mirror, tried to mirror my career off, which was when I was seven and eight years old, it was you. And then kind of my style of play adapted and I changed. And I ended up playing a little bit more like a sort of Mikel Arteta sort of role. And he was sort of my inspiration. And it's... It's really weird to be on the phone to you. So genuinely, from the bottom of my heart, thank you ever so much because this means this means loads to me personally. Oh, no problem at all. Any of it's hot blues, mate. No problem at all. Enjoyed it. Cheers, Paulie. I again appreciate, and I'm sure the people who watch this video will appreciate it, and they'll really, really enjoy it. So again, thanks very much for taking your time out. Uh, thanks for doing what you promised me on Friday. You do, you do appreciate. It. Thanks very much, mate. No worries. Take care, lads, and stay safe. Bye, mate. See you, mate. See you later.